Hey guys, what's going on? My name is Project and today I'm going through an awesome $500 gaming PC. And I've been requested to do builds for the US for a long time and if you're looking into getting a Steam-like gaming machine for Christmas, this is an excellent choice. For my UK viewers, I do recommend changing some things purely because of the price. Just know that for this build, I am including rebates. Now the system will handle new releases like Fallout 4 and Black Ops 3 with these, and stay tuned to the end to see benchmarks, but enough talking, let's get into it. Now for the CPU, you've got the infamous AMD FX6300, coming at $85. I'm sure you've heard of this often, but the processor runs at 3.5GHz stock and has 6 logical cores. I've noticed that games are starting to utilise more and more cores now, so this will definitely help you out, especially when more DX12 games get released. Now this is basically a sweet spot for the under $100 CPU category. And whilst it does have 6 logical cores, the individual core performance, or single threaded performance, isn't as strong as Intel's. That said, this isn't too important and won't make much of a difference, and it's still a great buy since you can overclock it, and the CPU does boast fantastic multi-core performance that packs a punch on a budget. Now because the CPU is well worth overclocking and runs like an absolute machine when we've done so, we're going to be using an aftermarket cooler, since the stock cooler they gave us is pretty shitty at overclocking. For this we've got the Cooler Master Hyper 212 Evo costing us $20. Now you can ask around and they'll say the same thing. The Hyper 12 Evo gives you great cooling for a low price and it's probably the most popular aftermarket cooler and it's certainly the most for air cooling. This will make sure that your CPU doesn't get too hot when we're overclocking and for this build it will do us nicely. Now for the motherboard I went with one that's really good for the price and will also give you expansion or upgradability options in the future. Now this is the ASRock 970M Pro 3 Micro ATX ATX AM3 Plus AM3 motherboard, costing only $37. Now this was around $6, but with the mail-in rebate, it drops $20 off the price. And whilst it's a Micro ATX size MOBA, it does have 4 DIMM slots and allows up to 2 GPUs. So yeah, I know some of you don't like ASRock, but their quality certainly has improved over the years, and this is no exception. It has, and I've mentioned, the ability to put in 4 RAM modules and supports up to 2400 MHz RAM. A max RAM supported is 64GB, but I can tell you now you don't even need half of that, and it does support RAID, Crossfire, but not SLI, that won't really matter that much, and a 6 6GB per second SATA port, that and USB 3.0 headers. All in all, this mobile might be the flashiest in terms of aesthetics, but for the price, it's a damn well steal and gives you so much headroom if you ever want to put in more RAM, drives such as an SSD, or even more, it allows you to add a second GPU if you so desire. Now onto memory, in the US it turns out that G-Skill is actually more cost effective than the Kingston HyperX. So this time we've gone for some G-Skill Sniper Series 8GB, 2.4GB, DDR3-1866 memory, costing us $35. Not really much to say other than this will occupy two of the four RAM slots on your motherboard, and even 8GB should be more than enough for gaming. Now as I've said, it is 2x4GB modules running at 1866MHz, so the memory speed doesn't really matter that much if you're not running graphics solely off of the CPU. Now it has got some nice heat spreaders which are black, with a little red head on the side, but this won't look out of place with the other components. Now as for storage, I've decided to go with a single Western Digital Caviar Blue 1TB 3.5-inch 7200 RPM internal hard drive. Now this drive does cost $50 and is considered more reliable than its Seagate counterpart, but I guess it's all down to chance. Now this drive is extremely reliable and 1TB should be more than enough to keep your OS, games, applications and other files on. Now if you want to, you do have the option to upgrade to an SSD in the future or add more drives specifically for games, etc. because of the motherboard, so don't think that you're tied to a single one. It does spin at 7200 RPM and it's pretty much a standard now, but for $50 it isn't half bad. Now for the graphics card, we have the Gigabyte Radeon R9 380 4GB SoC video card. It is $200 and it was either between this or the MSI version, though I thought that some people mightn't want the red and black theme, so instead the whole system's just going to be black. If you do really want a red and black theme, then go for the MSI model, but you won't see any performance or temperature improvements by going with that. Now this card does be out of the GTX 960 and most of today's newer and older titles. And with the DX12 support it will get, this is definitely a good reason to go for AMD over Nvidia, at least for this price point. Having looked at the benchmarks, they were pretty close, but this did stay on top for the majority by about 5 to 10 frames and the 960 was overclocked. Anyway, back on topic, this is a gaming build and so most of the money should be spent on the GPU, which is exactly what we've done. It has 4GB of GDDR5, which is great for 1080p and has a core clock of 990MHz. Now this card for AMD is a decent overclocker, it's not the best, but it's not terrible by any means, and especially with the Gigabyte cooler, it should help you out a lot. This card does also support Crossfire, so again, in the future you have the option to add another one into your system if you decide to do so. It has one DVI-D, one DVI-I, one HDMI, and one DisplayPort connection. This is a great card for $200 and comes with all of AMD's features such as virtual super resolution, free sync, iFinity for multi-monitor setups, DX12 support, and Raptor for recording game footage. Lastly, it does have a sleek looking metal backplate, which is nice to see, even at this price range. So yeah, this R9 380 is a great bang for the buck video card, and easily justifies its price tag. 
For the case, you've got the Thermal Take Core V21 Micro ATX Mini Tower Case at $35. I found it was difficult to find a budget case with good features. Now, there were some NZXT models, but those didn't include USB 3. And at this price point, I wanted to include it. Now, this case is small, but doesn't lack features by any means. It has a nice cube design and it's fully modular, which means that you can disassemble the case and put a side panel on the other side and change it up how you like. With this case, you can pretty much install parts in two ways. The mode facing upright, like you have with most cases, or flat, which I prefer for the look. Flat mode allows you to see the bottom of the graphics card with the side panel and has a proper chamber separation for the PSU. I think it does come with a pre-installed 200mm front fan, but it can be swapped out if you don't like blue. I'll try and go briefly over the features, so besides the motherboard placement, you can stack them, add tons of fans and radiators, there's also a chamber concept and it's well worth the money. It supports 3 internal 2.5 inch drives and 3 internal 3.5 inch drives, as well as having front panel with 2 USB 3.0 ports. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any room for any external drive bays. Most people don't need a DVD reader anyway, and you certainly won't need one for games. Trust me, this is an awesome case, and for the price, it's well worth it, even if it is made by Thermaltake. And lastly, we have the power supply. For this, I chose the Corsair CX750 Watt 80 Plus Bronze Certified Semi Modular ATX Power Supply, costing us $50. I will say that while 750 watts is overkill, and you only really need about a 600 watt PSU, I did have a hard time finding one above 550 watts. They either didn't have terrible voltage regulation or wasn't overpriced. Now this PSU is 80 plus bronze certified and has enough juice if you want to add a second GPU and it is semi-modular as well. And finally, <laughs> we get onto the benchmarks. Now Witcher 3 on Ultra at 1080p with Hairworks turned off gets 34 FPS stock and 39 FPS when overclocked. Turn these settings down will allow you to get that magic FPS as the usual. GTA 5 at high settings with 2 times MSI 8 at 1080p gets 53 FPS stock and 61 FPS when overclocked. And Crisis 3 on the very high preset at 2 times MSAA, again, in 1080p gets 44 FPS stock and 51 FPS when overclocked. Far Cry 4 is a similar story on Ultra at 2 times MSAA, again, at 1080p gets 45 FPS at stock settings and 52 FPS when overclocked, which is actually pretty decent. Battlefield 4 on Ultra at 1080p gets 68 FPS stock and when it's overclocked it gets 77. Now for new games like Fallout 4 on Ultra at 1080p it gets an average of 53 FPS. Black Ops 3 on Ultra, at 1080p again, it gets around 61 FPS. Again, with these results, they are just an approximation of the benchmarks I found online, composing the GPU and when possible the CPU. So I don't think this is exactly what you're going to get, but it's a good rough guide. Anyway guys, that's it for my $500 Steam Gaming PC build. This was my first attempt at doing a US build and since these builds are often strictly regulated around price and performance, which changes depending on where you're located, but do tell me what you think. Anyway guys, I really hope you have enjoyed it, and if you liked this video and thought it was helpful or learned something new, then leave a like, and if it wasn't, then dislike the video. I really appreciate all the support, and I hope this will help some of you out. This has been Proto, adios! And has a core clock of 990 megabert. Megabert? Nice. 2 times MSAA at 1080p gets 50 FT3, gets 50 FT3, done it again.